Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of PatCast. Today is April 16, 2024. It's Tuesday, and we are delighted to welcome Dr. Hadas Kapski, who is an assistant professor of dermatology at UC Irvine School of Medicine uh, in California. And today, see, we'll continue with our uh, board review series for this year. And uh, she is going to talk about uh, dermatopathology topics, which we believe will be very helpful for the residents who are preparing for their boards. And uh, as always, please feel free to post your questions and comments on Facebook and YouTube chat windows, and we will pass them on to Dr. Skavsky at the end of the lecture. And uh, thank you, Dr. Skapsky, for joining us today. Over to you now. All right. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to give this talk. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we're going to talk a high down path for the boards. This one is a little bit of a different format in that there is a self-assessment associated with it. So there are 10 questions that you can do ahead of time that were sent out with the uh, link to this webinar. Uh, if you did not get a chance do the self-assessment question, no worries. You will um, still get a whole a lot out of this. And afterwards, you'll be able to go back and uh, take a look at the virtual slides in more detail using this link. Uh, before I get started, I want to mention that images from this presentation were uh, borrowed from some of my favorite books. So Dramatology by Dr. Dirk Elston and Dr. Tammy Farringer is just the best primer in my dramatopathology that's out there. Um, that's um, a wonderful, wonderful um, basis to learn from. And the images are amazing. Uh, the next book is Dramatopathology Diagnosis by First Impression by Dr. Christine Coe and my mentor, Ron Barr. Uh, this book is a really unique book in that it takes a bunch of different derm path diagnoses that look similar on low power and compares them side by side. So a really kind of fun for derm path. And lastly, some clinical images are taken from Bologna, the uh, derm Bible. So uh, there are also images from the Twitterverse and the internet. If I have borrowed an image from you, uh, I tried to give credit. Um, if I forgot, please forgive me and let me know so I can add it. Our first question is a 42-year-old female with a nine-month history of blisters and erosions. And here is our virtual slide. Oops. So as we zoom in on that virtual slide, the thing that we see is that uh, the epidermis looks quite unusual. Um, in fact, it almost resembles a villi of the intestine. So it has this kind of villus structure. So what that means is that there was acantholysis. The uh, connections between the keratinocytes have, have broken apart uh, between those desmosomes. And so it's left us with what looks like a villus. That acantholytic process has extended down the follicles. So we can see follicular units involved by the acantholysis. And here's another follicular unit involved by acantholysis. When we look closely at those acantholytic cells, we can see that they're arranged uh, as almost little tombstones on a hill. So the hill being the dermal papillae that we see here, and these individual acantholytic cells are what's left of the basal layer. So this was what's called supra-basilar acantholysis. Um, it's really important when we're looking at uh, vesicular bullous disorders to know where is our split. Um, is it at the dermoepidermal junction? Is it in the epidermis? If it's in the epidermis, is it supra-basilar or kind of throughout? Um, or is it intracorneal? So this is a supra-basilar split with so-called tombstoning of those acantholytic cells. Also, another question we ask ourselves with vesicular bullous disorder, is there inflammation? And if so, what is it? So we see that this inflammatory infiltrate has some eosinophils. So this is a nice example of pemphigus vulgaris. Uh, I'm gonna include a little bit of clinical background for each of the cases that I present uh, because as a derm derm path, uh, I'm a dermatologist trained dermatopathologist. I'm a huge believer in the power of CPC. So for those of you out there learning dermatopathology, whether you're coming from dermatology or from the pathology side, 
Uh, there's a great power to knowing um, how to tie together both the clinical and the path. So if you're from pathology, how to learn the clinical and, and conversely, if you're a just really try to learn that path because that CP is um, how we use the diagnosis. Pemphigus vulgaris clinically, it's an autoimmune bullous disease with antibodies directed towards desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3. And it leads to flaccid blisters and erosions on the skin and mucous membranes. Uh, the blisters typically begin in the mouth. On pathology of pemphigus vulgaris, we see a supra-basilar split that is just above the basilar layer, and that results in that so-called tombstone row. The eosinophils are present sometimes in the thymosis or blister cavity in the epidermis, um, as well as in the superficial and sometimes deep dermis. There is a follicular extension, and that's important because that helps us differentiate from another intraepidermal uh, acantholytic process known as Haley Haley, which does not have perifollicular extension characteristically. Lymphocytes and eosinophils in the dermis and on direct immunofluorescence see a net-like or sometimes chicken wire IgG4 deposition as, as IgG1 and C3. So this is what's referred to as so-called tombstoning. There's a lot of buzzwords uh, in this presentation that I tried to highlight for you. So tombstoning being a buzzword for uh, pemphigus vulgaris refers to those individual acantholytic cells of the, of the basal layer that are stuck onto the uh, base of the dermis. So they are, if the dermis is like hills going up and down um, and those dermis, the tombstones are um, kind of resting on the hill. This is the immunofluorescence that we see characteristically with pemphigus. And you see that that net-like deposition of IgG uh, or chicken wire, it's an intercellular deposition because again, the antibodies are directed against those desmosomes connecting all those individual keratinocytes. And it's predominantly in the lower portion of the epidermis that we see it compared to pemphigus foliaceous, we'll see later on with the higher portion of the epidermis. When we look at vesicular bullous problems, really um, it can get a little bit overwhelming. There are so many entities uh, one way to really approach it to kind of simplify it is to really just ask two questions to start with. Where is the split? That can be either subcorneal, intraepidermal, superbasal, or subepidermal. Uh, and uh, is there inflammation? So uh, these, in these processes can be either palsy inflammatory or inflammatory. If they are inflammatory, what inflammatory cells do we see? This is taken from one's uh, pathology a dermatopathology test, just showing uh, in, a, another way to break down into different differentials based on where is the split. So blue being intracorneal, subcorneal, orange here being subepidermal, and green being intraepidermal. And then again, we asked ourselves about the inflammation. Is it posse inflammatory? Is it lymphocytic, eosinophil rich, neutrophil rich? And that'll help us uh, get to a differential that we can narrow down. Incorrect answer choices uh, for this case were dairy is disease. So I'll go over the distractor choice and also compare it side by side with the correct answer choice. So dairy is disease um, is uh, a condition that statistically presents with histopathology of hyperkeratosis. And the prominent reaction pattern that we see is called acantholytic keratosis. So acantholytic dyskeratosis is an important pattern to recognize. And what we see in acantholytic dyskeratosis is um, characteristically core rons and grains. So not only are the cells breaking apart, but they're also um, becoming dyskeratotic in a really unique pattern where some of the cells are ballooning, becoming round body or core rons, and some of them are kind of shrinking, becoming pathetic grain-like. Those are the grains. Uh, so when you see acantholysis with core rons and grains, that is acantholytic dyskeratosis. And acantholytic dyskeratosis has a differential of three main things, derriers, grovers, and warty dyskeratoma. Um, this is my little re remember symbol. So when I come across an important differential, I'll kind of urge you to remember this is something you can go back to as you're working through multiple questions or real life problems. Um, remembering these differentials can help you get to the right answer. Haley Haley can have slight acantholytic dyskeratosis, but it's not the most prominent thing there. So the, th the big three are the dairy grovers and Wardy D.
Here are those three side by side. So all three showing acanthalytic dyskeratosis, but the architecture is different. Dairies being a kind of a, um, a papule or plaque-like hyperkeratosis with acanthalytic dyskeratosis. A Grover's disease being some hyperkeratotic, often multifocal, small papules and erosions with acanthalytic dyskeratosis. And warty dyskeratoma um, is actually quite similar to dairies with that marked hyperkeratosis, but architecturally it's a more endophytic uh, process that is extending down a follicular structure. Here is pemphigus and dairies side by side, so a suprabasilar split without acanthalytic dyskeratosis for pemphigus, whereas Darius is going to be an intranormal split uh, with acanthalytic dyskeratosis and hyperkeratosis. Pemphigus uh, versus Grover's disease. So Grover's uh, was another answer choice, also one of our big three dyskeratosis differential. So we're going to look for corons and grains, slightly less hyperkeratosis than Darius disease. Dermatitis or pediformis was another answer choice. So that falls under the differential of a subepidermal split with neutrophils. So when the split is subepidermal and we ask ourselves what type of inflammation we have, oh, predominantly neutrophilic, we get to um, three that are neutrophilic subepidermal, which are dermatitis or pediformis, linear IgA, bullous dermatitis, and bullous lupus. A clue for dermatitis herpetiformis is neutrophilic papillitis. So of those three, if you see aggregates of neutrophils at the derma papillae, think dermatitis herpetiformis. Here is pemphigus and DH side by side. So pemphigus, a suprabasilar split with tombstoning, dermatitis herpetiformis, subepidermal with neutrophils. Haley, Haley choice. That's also known as benign familial. That has really prominent acanthosis. So of our acanthalytic things, Haley Haley is the most acanthotic. It is always acanthotic. So keep that in mind as you're trying to help differentiate it from others. The acanthalysis is not just superbasilar. You will see some areas with a superbasilar accentuation that can mimic pemphigus, but there are also more so-called full thickness acanthalysis involving at least two thirds, um, bottom two thirds of the epidermis. The full are characteristically spared. So that really helps it from pemphigus as well, because pemphigus loves to go down the follicles. There may be a little bit of acanthalytic dyskeratosis, but again, that's not the most prominent feature. And this may or may not have inflammation associated with it. Here is the uh, buzzword for Haley Haley is a dilapidated brick wall. So that acanthosis plus at least two thirds acanthalysis leads to that look of a dilapidated brick wall as seen here. Here is Pemphigus and Haley Haley side by side. So remembering um, both can have a super split, but in Haley Haley, uh, there's also really prominent acanthosis and that split extends throughout the bottom two thirds of the epidermis. Pemphigus going down the follicle, Haley Haley sparing the follicle. All right, our second question, which of the following would be the most likely finding on DIF? Now, this is a second order question. So boards just love doing second questions because for this, you not only need to know, be able to recognize the entity on the H&E, you also know the uh, pattern on DIF. Before we kind of uh, dissect the, the answer choices, let's take a look at our case. So here we see a um, punch biopsy that again looks to be um, a, a vesicular bullous process, but this time our split is subepidermal. So we have a subepidermal split, and um, the next question we ask ourselves: what sort of inflammation do we see in that split? So as we look inside, we see lots of neutrophils. A few eosinophils are in there as well. And looking towards the edge, especially of these lesions, you'll find a helpful, and that is that neutrophilic papillitis. So stuffed at the tips of the, the dermal papillae, we have these little collections of neutrophils. And that's a really helpful clue for dermatitis herpetiformis. So we mentioned the big three subepidermal split, dermatitis herpetiformis, linear IgA, uh, and bullous lupus, but those, the neutrophilic papillitis is really a each specific phenomenon. So when you see that, you're confident you're looking at dermatitis or pediformis, or 
want to do immunofluorescence to um, be sure to differentiate to, to make a, a definitive diagnosis and correlate with the clinical findings. Another clue that we see here is this so-called reverse festooning that's happening. Um, and that is our epidermis, um, as it's separating from the dermis, the epidermis, um, the, the reedy are remaining intact and they are therefore kind of forming this up and down undulation, this reverse festooning as they separate from um, the, the dermis. I'll show you uh, another example of that later. Now let's dissect our answer choices. So now we have to know what are all these uh, immunoreactivity patterns on DIF? So intercellular IgG and C3 predominantly in the lower epidermis we saw before as pemphigus vulgaris. Intercellular, same thing, but in the upper dermis would be pemphigus vulgaris. Granular Ig at the tips of the dermal papillae is herpetiformis. Granular IgA in the blood vessels is Kinoch Schonlein purpura or uh, IgA vasculitis, and a linear band of IgG and C3 along the basement membrane zone is bullous pemphigoid. Clinically, for dermatitis or pediformis, this is a manifestation of celiac disease with antibodies directed to epidermal transglutaminase 3, uh, and those are specifically IgA antibodies. It presents with intense pruritus, uh, and in fact, lesions are so intensely pruritic that clinically, we rarely ever see actually intact vesicles. Instead, we just see little erosions or excoriations. Um, so, so it doesn't actually come in as a, a bullous process often um, as a rule out. Uh, it's symmetrically distributed as on the elbows, knees, nape of the neck, and buttocks characteristically. And on pathology, very early on, we see those papillary dermal microabscesses of fills at the tips of the dermal papillae. On, um, we get that split that results in a ragged lined vesicle that reverse tuning containing numerous neutrophils. There may or may not be eosinophils, so keep that in mind. If you see EOs, that does not mean it is not dermatitis or pediformis. DH is predominantly neutrophilic, but there can be EOs in the mix. So of course we use um, to differentiate from other subepidermal uh, disorders with, with um, predominantly EOs and it's like bullous pemphigoid. We need to use all the clues and our uh, clinical findings and our DIF. The adjacent to the split um, have the, the neutrophilic papillitis. So look at the edges of the find that, because again, that's kind of the early findings. So that's going to be at the edge of your split on uh, DIF, that granular IgA in the dermal papillae. Uh, festooning, what does that mean? So festooning um, is basically when you hang a garland, uh, that's considered a festoon. Um, so here we see an example of festooning. And um, in dermatopathology, festooning is a buzzword for two things. Classic festooning in porphyria cutanea tarda, another form of subepidermal blistering uh, disorder that is pothy inflammatory. So we see a subepidermal split with no inflammation, often on apical skin, and that has this characteristic festooning where the dermal papillae are retaining their structure, so it results in what looks like um, a festoon. In in uh, dermatitis or pediformis, we have an upside down or a reverse festoon because the dermal papillae are retaining their, uh, or, sorry, the are retaining their their shape, and that's a ragged reverse festooning appearance. On um, DIF, we see uh, granular deposits of IgA uh, in the dermal papillae. And again, just remembering that vesicular bullets approach, first question we asked ourselves, if the split is subepidermal. Then we asked ourselves about inflammation, it's neutrophils. And that's how we arrive at the right diagnosis. Um, the big three split with, with neutrophils are dermatitis herpetiformis, granular dermal tips, uh, linear I bullous dermatitis, which is going to be linear Ig the basement membrane zone, and bullous lupus, which is going to be um, your linear uh, IgG, C3, and other immunoreactants. Dermatitis herpetiformis and pemphigus um, side by side, so looking at our incorrect answer choices. So pemphigus um, was our chicken wire cellular deposition, lower half of the epidermis of IgG. Pemphigus 
foliaceous is another answer choice. Pemphigus foliaceus has antibodies directed against desmoglein 1. And desmoglein 1 is pr primarily located in the upper portions of our epidermis. So what happens is when you have antibodies directed to it, the split is very, very high up, kind of subcorneal or in the granular layer. Um, and uh, it's uh, possibly inflammatory, usually might have some neutrophils or eosinophils. And as DIF findings, your position is, of course, going to be in your upper dermis. Here is just the little schematic of desmoglein 1 expression. So in our epidermis, we have desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3. And so um, if you can see, if you have antibodies directed against your desmoglein 1, breaking that apart, your split consequently is going to be in your subcorneal area predominantly. Pemphigus foliaceous um, has um, the intercellular chicken water like Pemphigus vulgaris, but up high, so upper half of the epidermis. Dermatiformis versus Pemphigus foliaceus side by side. Henoch Schoenlein purpura, also known as IgA vasculitis, is a variant of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So this on h &E, looks just like every other vasculitis that uh, we have, every other small vessel leukocytoclastic vasculitis. You need immunofluorescence to actually make the diagnosis that it's uh, linear IgA vasculitis or uh, henoch line. Here is what leukocytoclastic vasculitis looks like in general. So you have expanded vessel walls with fibrins, so this fibrinous degeneration of those small vessels in the dermis. Uh, and karyorexis, neutrophilic debris surrounding those vessels, often with extravasated erythrocytes. Here is dermatitis herpetiformis, henox line purpura side by side. In uh, IgA vasculitis, henox line, you get deposits of IgA around the vessel walls. Bullous pemphigoid was another answer that is antibodies directed against uh, bullous pemphigoid antigen 2 and antigen 1, those are in the hemidesmosomes connecting our, um, basal, layer, our uh, basal layer keratinocytes to the dermoepidermal junction. So the split is, of course, subdermal, and that results in tense, unlike pemphigus, which had flaccid bully that easily ruptured, becoming erosions, our break was in, in between, uh, inside the epidermis, super basilar, making it easier to split. These are more tense bullet. They tend to stay intact clinically. Um, and they can, the inflammatory uh, component, it can be either cell rich, often more EOs than neutrophils, or it can be posse inflammatory. So variable inflammation in bullet. The eosinophils are usually to the upper epidermis. That helps us distinguish like bullous allergic contact dermatitis and bullous arthropod assault that tend to have a deeper inflammatory infiltrate. On DIF, we see linear C3 IgG along the basement membrane zone. Here is bullous pemphigoid. Uh, um, clinically, again, those intact tense bullet compared to the erosions uh, and occasional bullet that we saw in pemphigus. Um, and on pathology, subepidermal split with eosinophils and neutrophils, linear IgG and C3 epidermal junction. One thing that I'll mention about pemphigoid as well is that there is um, a so-called urticarial form or bullous pemphigoid. So before it becomes um, a, a blister, and sometimes it's biopsied at this stage, it's important to recognize. So the early lesions often present with eosinophilic spongiosis. So you'll have some spongiosis in your epidermis, sometimes with eosinophilic exocytosis into the epidermis. And a, a nice clue is that your eosinophils will tend to line up at the dermal epidermal junction. So you see here uh, some eosinophils right at the dermal epidermal junction, lining up like an army ready to attack that junction. That is a helpful clue for urticarial. Titus herpetiformis versus bullous pemphigoid. Uh, so dermatitis herpetiformis, granular deposits at the tips of the reedy, subepidermal predominantly neutrophils, BP subepidermal neutrophils, and a linear band of IgG at the dermal epidermal junction.
Our next question asks us the diagnosis. And what we see in this biopsy um, on low power is really marked epidermal hyperplasia. So what's called pseudoepitheliomatous or pseudocarcinomatous hyperplasia. At quick glance, one might think this was a squamous cell carcinoma of the degree of uh, uh, squamous hyperplasia, even extension into the superficial dermis. But closer, see that there is a good deal of inflammation associated with that, more than we typically see in a squamous cell carcinoma. And in fact, there's actual uh, collections of neutrophils, so separative inflammation. And that is actually a differential that we know. So there is a differential called a PEH with pus, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus. And when you see the differential, we'll talk about it uh, in just a little bit, really you want to consider infectious processes. So anytime you see that, um, start to look around in your inflammation to find organisms. So we're kind of doing a quick kind of look around for organisms. Um, they'll, you know, be kind of uh, granulomatous and separative, and then boom, of our organism. So here is a spherule um, that has lacy uh, gray quality to it. It has a refractile wall. Um, and then when we're looking at organisms, um, especially round organism. One thing that's really helpful to let us know what this organism might be is knowing sizes of organisms uh, from one another. And um, a helpful clue, um, especially in a testing situation where you might just have a zoomed in image and not even know what, you know, what, what level magnification you're on, um, is use your internal rulers. So your internal rulers can be your lymphocytes, for example. A lymphocyte is about 10 microns in diameter. And so judging by um, the lymphocytes, this looks to be about maybe six, uh, six or seven lymphocytes across. So this is a fairly large spherule. And that is going to be consistent with coccidiotomycosis. Clinically, uh, coxie is also known as valley fever. Uh, we see it quite a bit here in Southern California where I am um, uh, in general in the Southwest United States. Uh, it's it's uh, airborne in the dust, so it's inhaled um, and it disseminates from the lungs to the skin. Importantly, you need not be immunosuppressed. I have seen this in young, healthy individuals. Um, so, so, so it's not something, just a, a disease of immune suppression. Uh, it presents as warty papules and plaque, sometimes can look umbilicated. On histology, we see that pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus. And again, there's a differential for that. Um, what that means is marked epidermal hyperplasia um, with a separative and diffuse or mixed granulomatous inflammation. We see large spherules. 50 microns on average, there is quite a variability to the size of the organisms, um, but on average, 50 microns is a good a good number to remember. Uh, they have a lacy gray and granular cytoplasm or fractile walls, and you may see endosporulations in late stage um, spherules. So here's some more pictures of coccidiotomycosis. Seeing um, here we see the variability in its size. Um, here we see an example of endosporulation. And so yes, the you know uh, fifty is an oversimplification, but just for the purpose of remembering one organism compared to another, on average these are fifty microns. They are fairly large spherules. Um, and um, uh, some more example, you can see them sometimes within um, multinucleated giant cells and sometimes free in the derm. The PEH with pus differential. So uh, one way to remember it is here come big green leafy vegetables. That differential, I believe, is published in Dirk Elsie's book, um, and I believe it is his differential. And I like to add mushroom pie. Mm, there are a few other infectious organisms as well that, that, can, that can give this reaction pattern. So um, highlighted in blue here are non-infectious entities that are on the differential. So halogenoderma is a very rare condition that we get when we ingest too many things like bromides or iodides, um, halogens, um, and uh, that can lead to these unusual um, skin lesions that present with pseudoepitheliomas, hyperplasia, and pus. 
Hemphigus vegetans, so the, the V is for vegetans or the, the vegetables, is a unique variant of pemphigus that has pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, but the pustules are eosinophilic rather than neutrophilic. The pi is pyoderma gangrenosum that can sometimes present with pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia and pus. And then everything else on the differential you see here is infection. So I pretty much like to remember everything more or less infectious can present with this um, reaction pattern. And when I see that reaction pattern, I immediately start to zoom in for organisms. Organism size is a really important thing to remember. Um, so use your internal rulers on your slide. A, a red cell is approximately seven microns, a lymphocyte, 10 microns, and newts and eos are approximately 12 to 13 microns. And then you'll always have those in the background to compare. Then you'll look at your organisms relative to those. So histoplasmosis and leishmaniasis are smaller than a red cell, less than half of a red cell. So they're tiny. Uh, and uh, cryptococcus, uh, 10 microns, about the same as chromoblastomycosis, which is six to 10 microns. Getting a little bit larger is gonna be blastomycosis and paracoxidiotomycosis, 10 to 20 microns. Coxy, uh, fairly large at 50 microns. And then there's rhinosporidiosis, which is huge, 200 microns. So different order of magnitude there. Blastomycosis was another answer choice. So also presents with PEH and pus. Oftentimes there's relatively few organisms. In um, so when I'm looking for a really long time for an organism and I don't find it and the answer are all infectious, I usually just go with blasto because it tends to be very posse uh, cellular in terms of organisms. Uh, they're more uniform in size and shape compared to coxy. They have a thick refractile asymmetric wall. If there's budding, it's a buzzword, broad-based budding. Um, but really in tissue, we seldom see budding. Um, so, so don't count on that. It's just going to look like a, a, a smaller round, 10 to 20 microns. It's larger than coccus, but smaller than coxy. Here is uh, our choice coxy and blasto side by side using our internal ruler our coxy which by the way can have endosporulation as a clue blasto does not but coxy does not always have endosporulation so the size is an important thing to, to remember about five lymphocytes across for coxy um, and about one to two lymphocytes across for blasto then cryptococcosis, another answer choice. So this is a little bit smaller at five to 10 microns. Um, and this can actually present with two uh, reaction patterns in dermatopathology. Uh, so in the skin, one pattern is a gelatinous or myxoid pattern. That's a pattern where there's um, relatively low uh, immunity. There's negligible inflammation. So the organisms just tend to kind of um, manspread, for lack of a better words. They have a really nice thick capsule. They take their their um, they take their space around, and um, this pattern is actually really easy to replace the organisms because there's so much kind of mucinous capsule. Um, the less uh, hard, the, the harder to detect pattern is the granulomatous pattern. That's where there's there's a strong immune response strong granulomatous inflammation, the organisms tend to aggregate multiple organisms within kind of one gelatinous capsule that's harder to recognize. Um, and um, keep in mind that um, they have a, a thinner capsule here. Um, and these are, again, smaller organisms at about five to are about the size of our lymphocytes. Coxy versus blasto side by side. Um, so five to 10 microns versus 50 microns, big size difference. Rhinosporidiosis uh, was another answer choice, is an aquatic protozoan, or at least it was when I learned it. It's technically now classified as a mesomycetozoa, which I think is like if a mold marries a fish or something, um, or protozoan. And so um, a really unique organism that is found in the water, it infects the mucosa of the nasal passages and the eyes. Um, this logically, we have huge sporangia with numerous endospores, so about 200 microns. Um, so these are four times the size of our coxy, which are big to begin with. 
Here's a beautiful picture of rhinosporidiosis from the Twitterverse. And here we see it kind of ready to explode with its endospherules and infect another individual. Coxie and rhinosporidiosis side by side. So again, order of magnitude difference. Um, so uh, average of 50 microns versus average of 200 microns. But both of them can have that lacy gray cytoplasm and that endosporulation. So if you don't know your organism sizes, you might get them confused. Pemphigus vegetans was another answer choice because it is on the PEH with pus differential. Um, again, this form of pH with pus is unique, um, so it has the asterisk because it's eosinophilic pustules rather than neutrophilic pustules like the rest of the differential. Um, and it's just an important to recognize you present with that pattern because oftentimes the uh, superbasilar acanthalysis, the pemphigus part of pemphigus vegetans, can actually be really, really subtle. So really important to recognize when you see that pseudoepithelium with hyperplasia and eosinophilic pustules, think about pemphigus vegetans, consider getting a DIF to exclude the possibility of pemphigus vegetans. Uh, here is coccidiotomycosis versus pemphigus vegetans, both showing that pseudoepithelitis hyperplasia with pus pattern. Uh, in coxie, it is, you know, neutrophilic pus. In pemphigus vegetans, it is eosinophilic pus. All right, our next question, number four. The best diagnosis here is, and what we see uh, in this punch biopsy is an ulcerated surface. Then we see superficial and deep, what looks like lymphocytic inflammation. That's a differential we can think about as well. But then we also see these vacuolated spaces. And when I see kind of those little holes, I, what immediately comes to my head is those adipocytes, are those um, things like paraffin, um, uh, you know, silicone that's, that's embedded, or potentially vacuolated histiocytes and vacuolated histiocytes make me think of infection. And sure enough, as we zoom in on these, they are vacuolated histiocytes and they are teeming with these little dot-like organisms. And the dot-like organisms are rimming the periphery like a marquee. So that's known as the marquee sign of leishmaniasis. So leishmaniasis clinically uh, is uh, from the bite of a fly uh, that transmits the leishmaniasis organism. There's different leishmaniasis species, old world and new world. The lesions, uh, the cutaneous lesions can be a uh, localized site of the bite or diffuse cutaneous. They can also spread in a lymphangitic pattern um, or also known as a sporotrichoid pattern uh, up an extremity. Uh, the lesions often ulcerate. They can even be mistaken for a basal cell. So. On uh, often a crusted or ulcerated and a mixed infiltrate of lymphocytes, cells, macrophages, um, some multinucleate cells, and often vacuolated histiocytes. And um, we get a dense, modular, and diffuse infiltrate, as well as a superficial and a deep inflammatory uh, infiltrate pattern. There is a differential for superficial and deep inflammation we'll talk about in a second. The intracytoplasmic organisms here are two microns and they are intracellular. So intracellular organisms have a differential that as well, the parasitized histiocytes differential. Uh, sometimes we see the um, kinetoplast, um, but you'd have to be really high magnification for that. As a dermatopathologist, my scope only goes to about 40X. <laughs> I'm a low power kind of gal. So I have yet to see a kinetoplast, um, but uh, you can see them. And CD1A, this can be tested, can um, highlight. So IHC for CD1A can actually highlight these organisms in addition to the tradi traditional GIMSA and skins. CD1A in Dermpath is famous for longer Han cell histiocytes where it highlights the histiocytes. But interestingly, for old world species of leishmaniasis, it is a really helpful stain. The marquee sign is something that we can see in leishmaniasis and is a helpful clip. So what that is, this is a marquee, the kind of now showing with light bulbs all around when the um, organism lines up uh, at the edge of the histiocyte, that is called the marquee sign. The super differential is a helpful one to know. This is when you see a at low power, a superficial and deep dermal lymphoid infiltrate, you can think of your seven L's. So that's uh, light lupus, 
uh, lichen striatus, lymphoma, lepidoptera, which is an L way of saying arthropod assault, lewis, which is an L way of saying syphilis, and leishmaniasis. So these are all things that can present with superficial and deep lymphocytic inflammation. Parasitized histiocytes differential. So when we see sites with intracellular little organisms, um, we have a differential his girl Penelope, and that's histoplasmosis, granuloma ingu inguinale, rhinoscleroma, leprosy, leishmaniasis, and penicilliosis. And um, there's also names for those intracellular organisms. So in granuloma inguinale, we call them Donovan bodies for the parasitized histiocytes. In rhinoscleroma, those parasitized histiocytes are called Michalik cells. Leprosy, they're called Virchow cells. And here we see um, at the bottom of those entities of parasitized histiocytes side by side. For uh, histoplasmos, different answer choice, I would say this is the most similar histologically to leishmaniasis because the same size organism, two to three microns, also intracellular. Um, but things that can help us distinguish is that there is a pseudo capsule around histoplasmosis. Um, so this is um, a fungal um, spore. And so around it, we have a small pseudo capsule. As a result of that kind of clearish pseudo capsule, we get a little bit more evenly spaced organism. You can see that they're kind of more evenly spaced up. You don't have that characteristic marquee sign of them um, going around the periphery of the histiocyte. So here is leishmaniasis and histoplasmosis side by side. Um, and um, for uh, leishmaniasis, um, the marquee sign being helpful, histoplasmosis, the lack thereof. Lepromatous leprosy is another answer choice. So this histology presents with a Grenz zone and a um, perivascular lymphohistiocytic infiltrate. Um, we have um, ample pale, uh, foamy cytoplasm that can form sheets. And the clearish cells, as we zoom in on them, the foamy cells are, are full of these uh, acid fast bacilli, the, um, the um, M. leprae species. And that's called Virchow cells. The, the histiocytes are the clumps of bacteria within the, the vacuoles called globi. Um, the nerve here thickened. So at scanning magnification, because this granulomatous infiltrate follows our adnexa and nerves, it can almost look like you have thickened nerves on low power. Of course, these are going to stay with, stain with fight and AFB. Leishmaniasis versus lepromatous leprosy, both parasitized histiocytes, um, but um, interest the uh, marquee sign, uh, um, organisms in leishmaniasis versus your Virchow cells of AF-positive organisms in leprosy. Lichen striatus was on our answer choices because it is another superficial and deep, one of our L differentials. This is a lichenoid and periadnexal um, inflammatory process. And um, it's interesting in that it has a lichenoid band, uh, which means, you know, a band-like inflammation at the dermal epidermal junction, but then also a deep involves the eccrine coils. And in between that lichenoid band and the eccrine coil, a so-called empty dermis. Uh, so there's basically nothing going on in between. Here's another example of lichen striated that empty dermis. So lichenoid infiltrate up top, the eccrine infiltrate below, and the so-called empty dermis in between. Leishmaniasis and lichen striatus um, both share that superficial and deep inflammation, but more no dense nodular and diffuse in leishmaniasis, empty dermis, lichenoid for lichen striatus. Uh, of course, as we zoom in here, we find parasitized histiocytes, and here we do not. Discoid lupus is also uh, an, on our superficial and deep um, acidic differential diagnosis, so lupus. Um, also has a lichenoid, um, superficial and deep uh, periadnexal. In this case, it's not just the eccrine coils, but also the follicles are very much involved and in fact, eventually get destroyed to form a scarring alopecia of discoid lupus. There is often follicular thing overlying. And of course, as, as a form of lupus, you would see uh, increased mucin deposition in the dermis. 
leishmaniasis versus DLE, both superficial and deep, but having our follicular plugging, our perifollicular uh, super deep infiltrate. Question number five is an 83 year old with a two centimeter bruise like plaque on the forehead. And the best diagnosis is here we see a punch biopsy. And as we zoom in, we see all these kind of rapid crack like spaces that are by hyperchromatic cells. Oops. Um, so um, as we zoom in closer, um, again, more of these cracks, hyperchromatic cells. And this is a really helpful clue. So here we have this crack-like cleft and hyperchromatic cells that are actually jutting out into the um, center of that space. And that is the called, uh, called the a creek phenomenon of angiosarcoma, which is a really unique finding, and I find as the most helpful clue for angiosarcoma. This presents uh, as a so-called malignant bruise um, in the um, in the idiopathic form. Um, this we see in um, elderly uh, on the forehead and scalp, so a bruise that doesn't go away. Uh, it can be associated with lymphedema and Stuart Treves syndrome uh, and post irradiation angiosarcoma. And this is a testable entity here um, is that in post irradiation angiosarc, there is a MYC amplification. On pathology, we see a poorly circumscribed dermal tumors with crack like spaces between the collagen bundles, uh, hyperchromatic cells forming these ragged fenestrations, so these ragged cracks. You can have papillary projections into the lumens of the spaces and um, these those hyperchromatic atypical cells floating into the, the lumen of those cracks like fish in a creek. Um, more on that in just a second. Markers, vascular markers. So CD31 is um, generally um, sensitive than CD34 for angiogram. Nuclear markers are really the best. So FLY1 or, are really great. Um, and then just remember that you can do um, a CMIC, uh, and, uh, and that's going to be positive in your uh, angiosarc associated with radiation. Um, they do like to test that. This is um, an article that um, pointed out my favorite clue for angiosarc. It's called Gone Fishing, a Unique Histologic Pattern in Cutaneous Angiosarcoma. Um, and what we see in angiosarc is that if um, if the these crack like spaces are the um, the the creek uh, that's formed, um, our fish are these atypical endothelial cells that kind of jut and project into the lumen, uh, kind of floating freely in those cracks. And this is helpful because a lot of times, um, as in the case that I just showed you, angiosarc might not actually be that bloody. Um, surprisingly, um, there there might not be that much um, uh, visible, you know, vascular. Just look like sometimes atypical cells all clustered together. But this fish in a creek is pretty much always there, so it really helps me finding at scanning pow power. Um, and I, I like to think of them as piranhas in a creek because they're obviously uh, evil fish. Angiolymphoid hyperplasia was uh, with eosinophilia was another answer choice. These are um, fish uh, often on the face, again, like lesions with lymphoid aggregates and eosinophils. So those are the three components that you need to, have to diagnose ALHE. ADM, like uh, little lesions of vessels, uh, arteriovenous malformation, um, lymphoid aggregates, and eosinophils. When we zoom in on endothelial lining, we see that um, there are hobnail endothelial cells lining the lumen. So that is a characteristic finding. Um, hobnail endothelium, so a hobnail is a large headed nail driven into the sole to protect against wear, um, but it's also apparently a really popular glassware phenomenon, and this ca uh, cashmere drill can be yours for only $129 at klimchi.com. Uh, but basically, we see here that uh, unique obnailing phenomenon. Angiosarc versus ALHE side by side. Again, those atypical um, fish in a creek, endothelial cells, and crack like fenestrations versus, you know, normal, well formed AVM like vascular channels 
plus, of course, your lymphoid and eosinophilic of ALHE. And here are hobnail endothelial cells compared to evil endothelial cells. Uh, our hobnail hemangioma um, or targetoid hemocytic, hemocytorotic hemangioma um, is something that is um, characteristic wedge shaped. Uh, and up top, we have dilated what looks like lymphatic channel like vessels and down low, a little bit more slit like um, vessels. And those vessels, as we look closer, are defined again by hobnail endothelial cells. So the two main hobnail entities you'll want to remember. Um, hobnail hemangioma, um, as well as angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. Um, we often will see hemocytorin um, in longstanding lesions, especially at the periphery, and that's what gives them clinically that targetoid hemocytorotic appearance. Angiosarc versus hobnail hemangioma side by side. Um, evil endothelial cells, perona, fissioner creek, uh, versus endothelial cells lining these vacuoles. Your papillary endothelial hyperplasia, also known as Masson's tumor, although it is not truly a tumor, it is a benign reactive phenomenon, which is really just an organizing thrombus. So you have um, a thrombus forming for any reason, sometimes uh, intravascularly, we get recanalization of the thrombus, fibrin in the thrombus, and then our uh, endothelial cells start to around and organize that thrombus we see as intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia. Um, and angiosarc versus intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia. Here we have organizing thrombus with really nice bland looking endothelial cells pretty much wrapping around all these little fibrin cores of the organizing thrombus versus crack-like spaces with atypical uh, cells. Papacy sarcoma. So this is an HHV8 sarcoma that is, uh, uh, the pathology varies in different stages. So early patch stage uh, KS has bizarre staghorn hepatic lymphatic-like vessels and cells. Um, later patch or plaque KS has a, a busy dermis, um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And nodular KS, which I've highlighted here because that's the one that's most likely to be confused with um, perhaps angiosarc, is a nodule composed of fascicles of spindled cells with red cells uh, between slit-like spaces. Uh, these, are, it, these are somewhat atypical, but not atypical as are angiosarc um, cells. Um, and they're more spindled and form slit-like spaces. Um, you can see some mitoses um, and often some hemocytorin and importantly, HHV8 positivity. Angiosarcoma versus nodular KS side by side. Again, spindled, mild atypia, slit-like spaces versus cracked, ragged fenestrations forming these abnormal creaks with those large atypical hyperchromatic chunky angiosarc endothelial cells. Question number six. So um, we're going to go uh, over today. Uh, hopefully, uh, if anybody has to leave after the hour, this will be posted online. We have 10 questions total. Um, so the it's going to be a long review. Um, but uh, those of you who can stay with me, stay tuned. For question six, oops, we have a um, a biopsy that at scanning magnification shows what's called a busy dermis. What that means is it just looks a little bit too much cellularity to the dermis. Um, uh, it's not, you know, a nodule or anything like that, but there's just too many cells all around. And as we um, zoom closer, uh, we're saying, what are these cells? Are they inflammatory cells? Well, there are some plasma cells. So maybe this could be syphilis, you know, um, but we, uh, as we keep looking, there's also these kind of or, or um, cracks forming in our collagen. And those cracks seem to be lined by these cells as well. So these kind of cells are endothelial cells. And so kind of finding those cracks in that busy dermis is a helpful clue. And in fact, those cracks actually form around pre-existing structures. 
So what happens is our endothelial cells in Kaposi's sarcoma start to wrap around everything, that, you know, they dissect the collagen. And they come across something that was there, like a vascular plexus or um, a follicle. They will start to wrap around everything and wrap and wrap and wrap until the cracks kind of jut around the pre-existing structures. And so that's known as the promontory sign. And now that we are familiar with it, we'll really kind of see it everywhere we look. So these spaces, um, here's a nice promontory, these spaces um, wrapping around pre-existing structures that then jut out into the space. So this is Kaposi's sarcoma. Clinically, Kaposi's uh, is again, HHV8 associated, and that's in virtually all lesions and all types of KS. We have classic Kaposi's, AIDS-related Kaposi's, immune suppression-associated Kaposi's, and African endemic uh, Kaposi's. On pathology, um, at this point, I'd like to focus on the patch plaque stage of KS, um, as the, that is the so-called busy dermal. So busy um, is um, any cells in the dermis, and I'll show you that differential in just a moment. The vascular wrapping here leads to the promontory sign. In Kaposi's, here we see a nice example of that vascular wrapping in, in patch plaque stage, irregular vascular spaces wrapping around pre-existing structures and dissecting the collagen to form the promontory sign. Um, a promontory is a high point of land that juts out into a large body of water. And so what happens is handled endothelial-like lined channels wrap all pre-existing structures, including exostructures and vessels. The pre-existing structures have a cleft around them or look like they're floating in a sea that is the dermis. Um, so here's a nice example of promontory sign. Busy dermis differential. So I actually love this differential. I know I think I say that about every differential, but gosh, I love my differentials. So busy dermis is one that's great. Um, the way to remember it is busy dermis killed grandma's sweet niece. Uh, stands for blue nevus, dermatofibroma, caposis, GA, sclerimixedema, and neurofibroma. And blue nevus, or sorry, uh, busy dermis is a um, phenomenon that's hard to quite describe. Um, I always kind of get, what is a busy dermis? I think the best way to understand busy dermis is just to see all these entities side by side. So this is what a busy dermis looks like. Busy dermis, just too many cells in the dermis. Um, nothing's, you know, disturbed or out of place. All our pre-existing structures are there. There's just too many cells. Um, and that is, um, Often, often the cells are somewhat spindly. Um, this is busy dermis in its many faces. Dermatofibroma is another entity on our busy dermis differential and was therefore an answer choice here. Um, what's characteristic of uh, DF, often we see plate-like acanthosis with so-called tabling of the reedy and hyperpigmentation. Um, and then we have that interstitial spindle cell proliferation um, when, when hypocellular, when, when not so cellular, that gives a busy dermis look. Um, when you have, you know, a standard DF like this, the center looks fairly cellular usually. It's almost like a bomb went off in the dermis. It's, it's centrally cellular. And then at the periphery, we get less and less cells. Um, and um, at the periphery is where we get our collagen trapping. I'll show you that in a second. Um, they love testing that DFs are factor 13A positive, CD34 negative to distinguish from dermatofibromas sarcoma protuberans. Uh, this is the uh, periphery of a dermatofibroma. So here is our central kind of explosion um, of our DF in the dermis. And at the periphery is where those fibrohistiocytes are wrapping around the collagen, trapping it, forming these collagen balls. So side-by-side, side, patch plaque KS and dermatofibroma, both busy dermis differential, um, but patch plaque KS having those spindle cells giving that busy component, and they are wrapping around all pre-existing structures, giving the promontory sign. Um, and in dermatofibroma, the characteristic collagen balls of the fibrohistiocytes wrapping around our collagen. Granuloma annulari is another busy dermis entity. Uh, this is Characteristically a biphasic um, inflammatory uh, infiltrate. For me, this is a nice clue at low power. What I mean by biphasic is that there is usually a, a somewhat cuffed 
lymphocytic infiltrate around the vessels, and then a separate infiltrate that is a palisading histiocytic uh, inter, uh, infiltrate interstitially. Um, in that palisading uh, component, we have necrobiosis of collagen, a little bit more about that later um, in the lecture. And this one characteristically has mucin deposition associated with that necrobiosis, giving a kind of bluish tinge to that necrobiosis with a palisade of histiocytes around it. So patch plaque Ka versus Ga, both busy dermis. Here are endothelial cells wrapping around everything. And here we have um, our interstitial uh, inflammatory infiltrate um, lymphocytes, histiocytes, giving that busy dermis, often in a palisading array with necrobiosis. Scleromyxedema is another busy dermis differential on low power. We have, um, uh, in this case, um, three things that are increased in the dermis. It's dermal fibroblasts. Uh, fine collagen fibers, and interstitial mucin. So all those three are completely mixed together in sclerimyxedema. Um, all those things are in the mix, um, and it is um, giving that busy dermis look at scan. So again, both busy dermis, but here it is the um, spindle cells. Um, here it is um, the, the collagen, the mucin, and the fibroblasts. Um, I should mention, um, you know, I, I specifically chose for our self-assessment here a, a case of patch plaque KS that was not very bloody, right? So here in this in this gorgeous photo from um, Sylvia Gottesman's uh, Twitter is um, a case of easy, more easily recognizable because of the um, the hemorrhage that's there. Um, but a lot of times in patch plaque KS, it might be more subtle than that. I really like this image because it, it, it gives that busy dermis vibe. Um, but just keep in mind that, you know, some of these entities you might, you know, consider when you're looking at a patch plaque KS that's not bloody. Um, syphilis. Um, so this is a vacuolar or lichenoid interface dermatitis, often with slender um, acanthosis. Neutrophils in the cornified layer can be a clue, um, and um, plasma cells are present in two-thirds of cases. So I put syphilis here in case anybody saw those plasma cells um, and said, oh, you know, this must be, you know, syphilis. And syphilis really can look like anything. You don't always have to have this classic lichenoid with slender acanthosis. You know, that's the most common presentation, but it is the great mimicker clinically and histologically. It can look like anything. So a lot of times when we see plasma cells, we think syphilis. Um, but of course, in this case, you, the, the trick is to recognize um, that busy dermis, the wrapping um, of endothelial cells. Uh, our question at number seven, best diagnosis here. This case, we see um, an ulcerated epithelium. And as we zoom in, we see a sea of uh, cells in the upper dermis. And they have kind of a palish, purple, um, hazy color to them. So zooming in um, on that, on those um, cells with abundant cytoplasm, we see, oh yeah, a lot of those are histiocytes. Um, so it's a sea of histiocytes with background. It's a fairly polymorphous infiltrate. So there's background every other cell you can imagine, um, you know, including eosinophils, neutrophils, um, uh, um, all sorts of reactive cells, but the key is to recognize these kidney bean um, shaped nuclei. Um, and uh, once we find them, we kind of see that they're in fact, they're everywhere. Oh, and they're um, uh, characteristically, we do see eosinophils um, in the inflammation. Um, so uh, one form of longer Hansel histiocytosis um, uh, is, is called eosinophilic granuloma. So that always helps you remember that there are eosinophils in the mix um, uh, in longer Hansel histiocytosis. Uh, and then as we look at our ulceration uh, or ulcerated epidermis, we do see that there is some epidermotropism of these lymphocytes. So they're making their way out into the epidermis. And in fact, you're even ulcerating uh, the dermis. So the um, longer Hansel histiocytosis often has epidermotropism um, and can have folliculotropism as a clue. Uh, 
clinically, longer Hans Bell histiocytosis is a spectrum of disorders. It can occur as an isolated lesion or with widespread multi-systemic involvement. Skin and bone are the most common sites. Um, the most classic presentation that we see it is in, is in um, uh, infants. Um, and um, sometimes it can appear very seborrheic dermatitis-like, uh, but seborrheic dermatitis that doesn't go away in an infant. Um, think longer Hans Bell histiocytosis and biopsy it. On histology, polymorphous inflammation, including eosinophils, those reniform kidney bean chain nuclei. Um, sometimes we see coffee bean or cleaved nuclei as well. Follicular tropism and epidermotropism can be a clue. Um, as you can see, here's a little bit of an epidermotropic uh, quality to those um, histiocytes making their way out to the epidermis. Um, and uh, just a, a quick word on staining, S100 positive, because they uh, they do like asking uh, stains for histiocytoses, differentiating them. CD1A positive and Langren positive is the characteristic staining profile of longer Hans cell histiocytosis. I've always loved longer Hans cells. Since I was a med student, um, I always thought longer Hans cells were kind of the cool guys of uh, heme path um, in that they always look to me like they're we wearing aviator sunglasses. Um, but apparently that's just me. Everyone else thinks they look like kidney beans and that's that's fine too. So the reniform uh, nuclei um, is another name for them. And the coffee bean uh, occurs when we look really, really close and see kind of the cleavage. Um, and that can be um, another way that they appear. This is another photo from Sylvia Gottesman. As you guys might um, surmise, I have a little bit of a Twitter crush on Sylvia Gottesman. She just posts the best uh, images um, and I always collect her images um, and, and use them in my teaching. So thank you, Sylvia, if you're out there. Um, we can see here all the different kind of clues. So the kidney bean shaped nuclei are coffee bean cleaved nuclei and are eosinophils all in the mix in longer Hans cell histiocytosis. Anaplastic large cell lymphoma is another answer choice. In that entity, we see sheets of large atypical lymphocytes in the dermis. Um, but the lymphocytes can be so large and atypical that they can form these so-called hallmark cells that have Reed Sternberg-like features. Um, and um, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that in a little bit, but those Reed Sternberg-like um, cells can sometimes look a little bit um, reniform as well. And that's why um, that in combination with a dense dermal infiltrate, um, I put that as a distractor answer choice um, for um, your longer Hansel histiocytosis. Uh, also, this is a polymorphous, like LCH, it's really polymorphous infiltrates. So you've got your reactive other smaller cells, lymphocytes, histiocytes, eosinophils in the background. Of course, we can distinguish by IHC. So CD30 is positive in more than 75% of um, the, the large cells in this infiltrate. Here are the a closer look at the hallmark cells of anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So to me, they've always kind of looked like what I call butt crack cells. So they, they're kind of cleaved and they look like little kind of little butts sticking out. Um, it almost takes up the whole, uh, the whole cell is just the, that, that nucleus. Um, and so, so more nucleus relative to the cytoplasm of our uh, longer Hans cells. Um, and then also as we look close at these, you know, butt crack cells, rather than kidney beans, they actually have these kind of googly eye quality of Reed Sternberg cells. Um, so that's why they're also called Reed Sternberg like cells. So side by side, longer Hans cells versus hallmark cells of, of ALCL. Um, again, more cytoplasm for our kidney bean or sunglasses, aviator sunglasses, longer Hans cells, no googly eyes, no Reed Sternberg-like quality, whereas here it's kind of all nucleus and um, a Reed Sternberg quality to those butt crack cells. Multicentric reticulohistiocytosis is another form of histiocytosis, also known as reticulohistiocytic granuloma. In this, we see a sea of purple histiocytes in the dermis with two-toned cytoplasm. So that cytoplasm can be a dusty rose or ground glass can be a buzzword for that. And they're often binucleate and multinucleate cells. Side by side are longer Hans cells versus multicentric reticular histiocytosis. The histiocytes have a very different quality to them being kind of multinucleated forms with two-tone ground glass cytoplasm here.
Mycosis fungoides, um, I put here as a distractor because of the epidermotropism. So in mycosis fungoides, we have an epidermotropic um, infiltrate with a vacuolar interface dermatitis. But in this case, the, uh, the epidermotropic cells are atypical T lymphocytes. These atypical T lymphocytes tend to line up along the dermal epidermal junction. Uh, and they are hyperchromatic and often surrounded by a white space, uh, kind of like a lump of coal on a pillow. So these are our hyperchromatic uh, lymphocytes in mycosis fungoides. Sometimes those lymphocytes can aggregate in the epidermis, forming potriase microabscesses. Importantly, there's very little spongiosis because we can also have, you know, exocytosis of lymphocytes in other, you know, um, reaction patterns. Spongiotic dermatitis often has exocytosis. But the key thing in, in MF is that the exocytosis of lymphocytes is way out of proportion to the degree of spongiosis. There's way more lymphocytes in the epidermis than we can account for by saying, well, they just went in there because of the space of the spongiosis. Um, so that's that's really uh, important. Um, low, low spongiosis relative to lymphocytic exocytosis. There's often a chronicity to these lesions. So we end up with a kind of wiry papillary dermal fibrosis as another clue for mycosis fungoides. So Langerhan cell versus uh, MF, both epidermotropic um, things, but in this case, we have epidermotropic histiocytes and LCH, and in MF, we have epidermotropic atypical lymphocytes. Rosai Dorfman um, is uh, also known as sinus histiocytosis with massive lymphadenopathy, um, and that can have cutaneous manifestations. Um, what we see is a starry sky appearance in the dermis at scanning power. So really low power, we get that starry sky vibe. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and that starry sky is formed of sheets of histiocytes. Those are the lighter areas, these kind of lighter histiocytic areas with nodules of darker lymphocytes. Um, and the characteristic feature of rosei Dorfman is amperipolysis. So amperipolysis is uh, intact lymphocytes and plasma cells passing through histiocytes. So they're not broken down. They're just making their way through the cytoplasm of these light histiocytes um, as if, you know, there's nothing happening. And that's a really unique finding, the amperipolysis. That is pathognomonic for rosei Dorfman. Staining wise, these are S100 positive histiocytes and CD1A negative. This is what's referred to as the starry sky of Rosai Dorfman. So um, at, at low power, uh, and this is a really helpful clue that, that can help you find it, we see um, a dark sky, which is those lymphocytes, kind of pierced by the stars, which are the lighter histiocytic areas. Longer Han cell histiocytosis versus Rosei Dorfman, um, the histiocytes uh, here um, being um, uh, the kidney bean shaped and epidermotropic versus Rosei Dorfman, starry, sty starry sky at low power, and empiropolysis as the key feature. Our question number eight shows a nice excisional specimen, and we see a bulky tumor kind of filling the deep reticular dermis and piercing into the subcutis. And as it's piercing into the subcutis, even at low power, we can see that it's really kind of chewing into the fat um, and dissecting into it. Um, and that's so-called um, a honeycombing um, pattern into the adipocytes. Um, as we look at what sort of cells comprise this bulky proliferation, we see that they are um, these kind of um, slender spindled cells that are forming fascicles that are intertwining um, uh, in a um, almost um, story form pattern. So this is what's referred to as um, story form. Some people call it pinwheeling or cartwheeling, um, but these kind of intersecting fascicles going every different direction. Oops. Um, and so um, looking at the um, uh, dissection through the fat, once again, this is the so-called honeycombing. So um, our, our spindled cells are dissecting through our adipocytes, sometimes leaving them lined up in a row. That's a really unique characteristic. So, so they're kind of forming rows and just dissecting every which way through that fat. And that is really um, uh kind of unique and characteristic feature of dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. Clinically, these present on the trunk and proximal extremities. 
um, as large, often multilobular tumors. They have translocation of collagen 1A1 and PDGF beta. On histology, densely hypercellular tumor with a story form or starry sky pattern um, that's also known as pinwheeling and infiltration of in a honeycomb pattern. CD34 positive and factor 13A negative. So that is um, a really important um, to distinguish from dermatofibroma, um, which has the opposite staining pattern. On histology, um, this is what's referred to as the um, story form um, pattern, and this is what's referred to as the honeycombing through the fat. The starry sky, so we heard um, starry sky before. Starry sky is actually used for two things in derm path. So one is DFSP and one is rosidorfin, but they're actually very, very different starry skies. So DFSP, it's referring to the Van Gogh starry sky painting. So specifically this image of a starry sky um, where um, this is what the kind of fascicles of those spindle cells look like as they're interweaving with one another. So this starry sky versus rosidorfin is an actual starry sky. <laughs> it's a dark sky with bright clouds of his deocytes. Uh, the story form pattern um, can also be akin to um, a pinwheel uh, pattern of the fibrocysteocytes or cartwheeling of the fibrocysteocytes. A cellular dermatofibroma is another answer choice. So this is a variant of dermatofibroma, benign dermatofibroma that is bulky and cellularly dense. It tends to fill the dermis and it can kiss the subcutis. So it can kind of touch and encroach the subcutis, but it does not ever dissect into the subcutis the way a DFSP does with the honeycombing. So up close, um, uh, here we have more of a story form pattern. Although sometimes in a cellular in a cellular DF, you can get a, a hint of a of a story form pattern as well. So that's where you're going to look for your other clues as well. So cellular DF tends to be higher up, more centrally based in the dermis, and then may kiss the subcutis but not dissect it. Whereas DFSP typically based in the deep dermis and dissects into the fat characteristically. Um, so here we have the DFSP dissecting into the fat, whereas the base of our cellular DF is kissing the fat, but it is not, it is respecting it. It is not dissecting through it, causing that honeycombing phenomenon. Desmoplastic melanoma was another answer choice um, here as a kind of atypical spindle cell proliferation. In this tumor, we have a dense desmoplastic stroma, often nodular lymphoid aggregates can be a clue. And if we look hard enough, we'll often find a subtle overlying lentigo maligna at the junction somewhere in a desmoplastic melanoma. Importantly, SOX10 is your most reliable marker. Other immunostains like HMB45 um, may not stain the melanocytes in a desmoplastic melanoma. Um, the atypia of spindle cells is variable. So there might not be very much atypia at all. Sometimes it can look kind of scar-like. So it's a little scary for dermatopathologists to, it can be mistaken for a scar. But again, those lymphocytic aggregates are um, a clue. Um, and perineural extension is common. DFSP versus desmoplastic melanoma. So um, both are kind of bulky um, uh, dermal tumors that are spindle cells. But of course, um, here we have more of the story form pattern and the honeycombing. And here we just have the kind of intercellular uh, um, or, or kind of diffuse infiltration of these spindle cells with variable atypia. Lyomyosarcoma, another kind of dermal atypical spindle cell proliferation. Uh, it, on histology, it often looks very lyomyoma-like. Um, but um, some ugly, more pleomorphic cells and a few mitotic figures. Now, um, when I was training, we called, you know, what we see here, a lyomyosarcoma. Now it's actually fallen out of favor um, because it's turned out that when the tumors are limited to the dermis, even, even if they're really kind of ugly cytologically, the prognosis is excellent, much better than a true lyosar myosarcoma, which is kind of in the deeper subcutis. So um, now it is best to call these atypical intradermal smooth muscle neoplasms when they're limited to the dermis. Um, this is a DFSP versus a lyomyosarcoma or an atypical uh, dermal um, uh, neoplasm. We have um, our Spindle cells in um, the lyomyomatous tumors are going to be uh, 
cigar shaped blunt ended nuclei characteristically rather than our um, fiber histiocytic cells um, forming storage form connections. Schwannoma is a deep dermal or subcutaneous tumor with a, a capsule. We have antony A areas that are separated, um, that, that are rows of nuclei or palisaded nuclei separated by acellular areas shown here. So these are our Viro K bodies. Antony B tissue is the more degenerative changes, um, edematous stroma, um, and we often see that just beneath the capsule. Schwannoma, of course, is S100 positive. Um, so DFSP versus um, schwannoma, another kind of a, a, a deep dermal or subcutaneous spindle cell neoplasm, but um, st story form versus uh, Vero K bodies. Question nine is an 18 year old with uh, an asymptomatic macules and papules on his trunk and extremities. The best diagnosis is So here we see a punch biopsy um, and at scanning power, um, I'm seeing a lichenoid band obscuring the dermal epidermal junction. Also seeing some changes to the um, granular layer here, uh, maybe a little bit of perikeratosis. And then also noticing that there is a somewhat wedge shaped dermal infiltrate. So um, wedge shaped dermal inflammation beneath this lichenoid band. As we zoom in, um, in our epidermis, we see, in fact, yes, there is some perikeratosis. And not only is there perikeratosis, but there's these little kind of dark um, uh, fragments in the, uh, in the perikeratotic corneum, and that is degenerated neutrophils. So neutrophils often don't look like neutrophils anymore in the cornified layer. They just look like hyperchromatic little um, fragments. Um, but it's important to recognize that there are some neutrophils in there. And um, neutrophils in the cornified layer can also give guide us to a differential. We have a newts in the horn differential, of course. Um, as we look closer at our epidermis, we see some erythrocytes that have made their way into the epidermis. So there is exocytosis of erythrocytes. There's actually lots of them when we look around. And there are scattered dyskeratotic or dead red keratinocytes as well at all levels of the epidermis. So this is a nice example of pleva, pteriasis lichenoides, a variolaformis acuta. This presents in children, teens, young adults on the trunk and extremities as papules or vesicles, erosions that evolve to ulcers and variolaform scars. Uh, typically these present as crops of lesions at various stages of development. On pathology, we see the perikeratosis Oh, one thing I love about pleva histology is that the uh, histologic findings can be remembered as a mnemonic of pleva. So the P is for perikeratosis plus minus neutrophils in the horn. When you see the neutrophils in the horn, that's a helpful clue. Um, lichenoid, uh, L is lichenoid or vacuolar interface dermatitis. E is extravasated erythrocytes. So there's often extravasated erythrocytes in the upper dermis with that often transepidermal elimination of those red cells. V is for vasculitis, um, which is a bit of a stretch here because it's a lymphocytic vasculitis, okay? Not our typical LCV neutrophilic vasculitis, but lymphocytic vasculitis, which is really to say a superficial and deep perivascular lymphocytic uh, infiltrate. Um, it's often CD8 predominant. And A is for those apoptotic keratinocytes. So those dyskeratotic, apoptotic, dead red keratinocytes that are going to be scattered throughout our epidermis. The neutrophils in the horn differential is another favorite. Um, so I learned this as uh, PTIX, um, and I believe this is another Elstonian differential, um, which is uh, which um, is classically psoriasis, tinea impetigo, candida, syphilis, and sebderm. But I also add in um, pleva, so I call it PPTIX, um, because pleva also has newts in the horn often, and that can be a helpful clue to find it. When you see lichenoid plus newts in the horn, that's actually a really helpful combination. Nothing else really does that. Fixed drug eruption for comparison is another vacuolar interface dermatitis with full thickness apoptotic dyskeratotic keratinocytes. So it shares those features with um, pleva. They're both lichenoid or vacuolar interface. They both have full thickness dyskeratotic keratinocytes. Um, but the um, hornified layer of fixed drug is always basket leave acute. So a completely normal um, cornified layer. That's a really unique finding in fixed drug. 
um, where we have this as the quantified layer is as if nothing happened, but then we have more chronic changes in the dermis. Uh, and those chronic changes are a little bit of fibrosis, some pigmentary incontinence. Um, and that's because with fixed drug eruption, um, it happens acutely um, when, when the eruption happens, but it keeps recurring at the same site. So in the dermis, the dermis is like, I've seen this before, <laughs> but our epidermis is reacting as if it's for the first time. Um, and our inflammatory infiltrate here um, as a drug eruption is going to be a polymorphous infiltrate, often with eosinophils. Pleva versus fixed drug, again, both showing that lichenoid, um, uh, full thickness dyskeratosis, but um, acute cornified layer here versus parakeratosis, often with neutrophils for pleva. Uh, and in pleva, you actually should not have eosinophils. So extravasated red cells, yes, um, but not eosinophils. It's really a lymphocytic process, um, whereas uh, your drug eruption and more polymorphous eosinophils, sometimes neutrophils as well. Lymphomatoid papulosis um, I, is, is another good answer choice here because um, type A, LYP, is known also as evil pleva because it looks a whole lot like pleva. Now, when I was training, there was lymphomatoid papulosis types A through F. I think now they're just marching their way down the alphabet. There's a gazillion subtypes um, outside the scope, of course, of this review. But type A is actually the most common and the most likely to be confused both clinically and histologically with pleva. So we also get these kind of ulcerated multifocal lesions, um, also happens in young people. Um, so they look similar. Um, and histologically, there are some similar features as well. It is also a wedge-shaped infiltrate um, with a lot of um, T cells. In this case, though, we get these enlarged CD30 positive T cells um, that may have Reed Sternberg-like uh, features. Here, the inflammatory infiltrate is a little, a little bit more polymorphous, so there are often neutrophils, EOs, um, and background small lymphocytes in the mix as well. Pleva versus LYP type A, so-called evil pleva. Um, really, you, it's, it's like the key is zooming in and finding those large atypical lymphocytes and then doing a CD30 stain and confirming that this is a CD30 positive proliferation of a lymphomatoid papulosis. So whenever I see a case of pleva, always, always I zoom in and look for atypical lymphocytes. And if I have any doubt in my mind, I'll just throw on a CD30 just to make sure I'm not missing an LYP. Psoriasis. So psoriasis was put as an answer choice here, really because of the neutrophils uh, in the horn. Um, so uh, I, I just kind of wanted an excuse to teach a little bit about psoriasis. So neutrophils and parakeratosis in the cornified layer um, is really characteristic of psoriasis. We may or may not see a wafer scale. I'll show you that in a second. When we do, it is super helpful. There are um, regular regular meaning it ends at the same point in the dermis you see how they're all kind of hitting the same the same areas that's regular acanthosis um, rather than different length 3d um, regular they're often a bulbous or club shaped acanthosis and in fact they're so bulbous and so chunky that they end up interlocking with these um, dermal papillae which are also chunky um, and that is what gives the so-called dovetail uh, sorry dovetail or camel foot uh, property to our um, epidermal and, and dermal connection here. Um, so that's a nice kind of unique feature of psoriasis. I don't hear it talked about too often, but I find it as a really helpful clue um, for psoriasis when I'm looking at cases on a daily basis. Um, and um, the, the thinned superpapillary plates is a nice helpful clue as well. So we get this kind of hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis with neutrophils, and then this hypogranulosis, and then this um, ep these epidermal, um, uh, the epidermal is, is thinned over this dermal papilla that is extending super high up with dilated tortuous vessels inside. So what that lends to is actually, um, it, it translates clinically into the so-called auspitz sign. The auspitz sign in psoriasis is when you pick off the fixed uh, silvery scale of psoriasis, you get pinpoint bleeding. And this is why that happens. This is why the auspice sign happens. You pick this off, you have this thin superpapillary plate and right beneath it is this dilated tortuous capillary. Um, so um, features of psoriasis, wafer-like scale. So wafer-like scale is this. It's dry parakeratosis 
um, being kind of the wafer component. Um, and then layers of neutrophils. And again, you might not recognize neutrophils in the cornified layer. They don't look quite like neutrophils do in the dermis because they've lost their cytoplasm. They're not quite as neutrophily, but recognize them by just these kind of large, almost kind of like, like smushed ant pieces, if that makes sense. Smushed ants in your cornified layer is what neutrophils look like in the cornified layer. And here we see layered neutrophils in the cornified layer forming kind of like that cream between the dry wafer. Wafer-like scale, we don't always see it in psoriasis, but when you see this wafer-like scale, it is psoriasis. Nothing else does this. So I love it. Sometimes I'll put a, a slide down, two seconds, I say psoriasis. How'd you know? It has wafer-like scale. All right. Cleva versus psoriasis, really the only thing that they have in common is the newts and the horn. I hope nobody uh, confused these two. Um, but um, just important to remember that these are both newts and the horn uh, differential, otherwise completely different inflammatory reaction patterns. Syphilis um, is another newts in the horn entity. We talked about it a little bit before, so I'm not going to go into the details again, but suffice it to say, uh, newts in the horn, uh, often with a lichenoid inflammation, um, a slender acanthosis, um, um, but it does not have the full thickness dyskeratosis, the extravasated erythrocytes, the superficial and deep wedge-shaped infiltrate of cleva. All right, and our final question. We have a nice, oops, a nice punch biopsy. And the first thing that that pops that jumps to my head as I see this punch biopsy is, oh boy, that is squared off. Normally when we see a punch biopsy, it tapers, you know, so it's kind of thicker at the top and it kind of tapers down towards the fat. But in this case, it is squared off. So square punch, rectangular punch, boxcar punch, all names for that same phenomenon of this chunky punch. And that happens with all sorts of entities that are somewhat sclerotic um, in the dermis. Um, um, and so all, some sort of major alteration in the collagen that has made the collagen really bulky. Um, so in this case, it's not quite sclerosis, but instead it is necrobiosis of collagen. And so what that means is the collagen is somewhat pale and sickly. It's lost its cellular quality and it's lost its fibrillar quality. So if we look, I don't think there's actually any healthy, uh, healthy collagen um, left in this biopsy, but here's one strand of healthy collagen right here. It has a nice fibrillar quality, um, individual fibrils well-defined. If we look at our necrobiosis, we've lost that fibrillar, well-defined, healthy collagen look. That's necrobiosis. Um, and in this case, um, it's necrobiotic. Um, and that, necrobio that necrobiosis that's filling the dermis um, from top to bottom, side to side, is layered. So we kind of see almost kind of these layers with inflammation, uh, layers of necrobiosis, inflammation. And that inflammation is um, kind of lymphoplasmacytic. And this is a beautiful example of necrobiosis lipoidica. So it used to be called necrobiosis lipoidica diabetic quorum. Um, and I still abbreviate it NLD because of old habits. I think a lot of derms do. So you might see it come in as rule out NLD, even though most of the time it's actually not associated with diabetes. So now we just call it necrobiosis lipoidica. Um, on the lower extremities is where it happens. Red atrophic plaques, often with a little bit of a yellow orange tinge to them. And histologically, we, we have that rectangular punch phenomenon, which of course there's a differential for that. We have necrobiotic collagen um, and there's a differential for that as well. And um, that horizontal layering of the collagen um, with the, the necrobiosis and inflammation giving a layer cake appearance is a buzzword for necrobiosis lipoidica. Here, another Sylvia Gottesman photo of necrobiosis layer cake appearance. Um, so in this case, um, showing it compared to a layer cake parfait type situation. And I have my own NLD layer cake situation. So this was for my um, daughter's fourth birthday party it was a mermaid party. I decided to make a three layer cake. And this was an ambitious feat. I have zero um, experience. Um, and so, um, of course it was a major disaster. You see it crumbled here in the middle with this open kind of monster mouth. And so when you have a cake fail, you let your kids decorate it, which is what we did. Um, and this is what it turned out 
in the end. Um, I did not serve it at the party. We just had fun with it. <laughs> but this is my uh, layer cake fail, which I think looks a whole lot like NLD. Boxcar square punch differential. So um, this uh, things that can look squared off are morphia, chronic GVHD, radiation dermatitis, scar, scleroderma, connective tissue nevi, NLD, and even normal back skin. Our necrobiosis differential, we can divide into um, two uh, uh, different uh two different patterns, red necrobiosis and new, blue necrobiosis. Remembering that necrobiosis is a blurring and loss of definition of the collagen bundles and absence of nuclei. Um, red necrobiosis um, can result from either fibrinoid deposits and rheumatoid nodule, from major basic protein from eosinophils and well syndrome, degenerated collagen like we see here in NLD, in NXG, and in epithelioid sarcoma, which is another important entity to remember on necrobiotic differentials. Um, blue necrobiosis is um, often blue because of the mucin, um, and um, that can be seen in GA. Nuclear debris can cause blue necrobiosis, as in um, the uh, entity formerly known as Wegener's and the entity formerly known as Churg Strauss, as well as palisaded neutrophilic and granulomatous dermatitis. Chronic radiation dermatitis is another entity on our square punch differential. Uh, our epidermis is variable, but usually shows some hyperkeratosis and atrophy. There are irregular ectatic vascular units. In fact, they can be so ectatic that I've seen these miscalled without correct CPC. I've seen these miscalled as vascular malformations. Um, uh, it's important to recognize that beneath that ectatic, beneath those ectatic vessels or within those ectatic vessels, there is homogenized um, sclerotic dermis um, and radiation fibroblasts, these bizarre, somewhat stellate fibroblasts. NLD versus radiation dermatitis, both square punch. However, NLD having that layer cake necrobiosis, radiation dermatitis is sclerosis associated with radiation fibroblasts and dilated capillaries. Granuloma annulari is on our necrobiotic collagen differential. Um, and uh, note though that it's not on our square punch differential. It is a normal tapered process because we don't have kind of full thickness side to side change of the collagen. We have that biphasic appearance. We saw this before. Um, and the necrobiosis is with uh, mucin giving it a blue tinge. NLD versus GA side by side. So square punch, not square punch. Our necrobiosis in a layer cake arrangement versus necrobiosis in a palisading histiocytic, um, a palisading uh, kind of uh, uh, array blue versus red necrobiosis. Morphia, we have uh, another square punch entity, thick, hyalinized, closely packed collagen bundles. Loss of adventitial fat can um, result in trapped eccrine glands. And there is a sparse, uh, deep lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. Uh, another thing that they might test is that there's a reduced number of CD34 positive interstitial cells in the dermis. So that's a nice, helpful finding. Um, you can do a CD34 stain and it is absent in the dermis of morphia. NLD versus morphia, both square punch. However, NLD having, of course, a lot of inflammation layered with the necrobiosis um, and this having just a ton of sclerosis and very sparse lymph lymphocytic inflammation. But both are lymphoplasmacytic, um, if you think about it. NXG, another member of our square punch differential, um, and actually has quite a lot in common with NLD. Um, but in NXG, we also have that red necrobiosis. In NXG, we tend to get these kind of X-shaped zo zones. So rather than the kind of stripy layer caking, we have X-shaped um, necrobiosis. And um, the um, inflammation surrounding it has more going on. It's got lipidized histiocytes, multinucleated wreath cells, including Teuton cells. Um, it's got neutrophilic debris in the necrotic with some um, within the necrotic areas. It's got cholesterol clefts often, um, as well as the plasma cells and some lymphoid follicles. So kind of just more stuff going on, including those helpful cholesterol clefts as a clue to NXG. Side by side, so layer cake of NLD um, versus I think of NXG as more of a um, stripy kind of um, bacon. Um, and that helps me remember that it's got those cholesterol clefts in it.
So that's, <laughs> thanks for those of you who stayed throughout the whole presentation. That's the last slide I have. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, despite the cake fail, the mermaid party was a success. I'm happy to take questions. So I'll look at the chat now and I'll turn my video back on. And so, got it. So how to um, best differentiate KS from benign vascular lesions on um, H&E is our first question. So, um, of course, that's going to depend on the stage of, uh, of KS, but, and it can be hard because our, um, our spindle cells in KS are not, are not that atypical. Surprisingly for a sarcoma, they're often not that atypical. For me, I would say it's really an architectural thing. So KS is going to be the only one that's going to be dissecting through the collagen and wrapping around preexisting structures. Nothing else does that in its, in its, um, patch platform. Um, and in our, uh, you know, whereas any kind of benign proliferation is going to form well-formed channels rather than these like split like cracks. As you saw in our case, you can't even tell sometimes that it's vascular looking at KS. It's not like, you know, unless there's actual hemorrhage in there, you might not even be able to tell, like in the case that I showed you, that it's actually vascular. And so, you know, a real vascular proliferation is going to form well-formed channels, not these little slits as these atypical cells are just kind of migrating their way in every direction across collagen bundles. Um, so I hope that's helpful for patch plaque. As far as nodular, um, of course, you're going to have your um, slightly more atypical spindled cells with slit-like spaces. Um, those do tend to have a little bit more cytologic um, atypia. Um, and of course, if you really need, um, throw on an HHV8, right? And that'll, you know, no, none of the benign things are going to be HHV8 positive. Um, how reliable is promontory sign um, in, uh, in ruling in KS? Got it. So when you see promontory sign, you can, pretty, you know, it's pretty specific for KS, but can you rely on it? No, because um, again, you know, it evolves through different stages. So you might have, you know, the promontory sign is characteristically for kind of that middle patch plaque stage. The very early patch will not have it. The tumor stage will not have it. Um, and of course, as lesions evolve, it might not have evolved into that promontory yet. It needs to kind of wrap around pre-existing structures several times in order to make them jut out like that. Um, so as far as, um, you know, um, ruling in, you know, I would say, you know, definitely ruling out. I would not, you know, say, oh, well, there's no promontory sign. It's not KS. How to differentiate um, Pempigus vulgaris and Haley, Haley on immunofluorescence. Um, so Pemphigus vulgaris is an immunobullous um, uh, uh, process that, well, actually, okay. So good question on the Haley Haley. Hang on one second for that. Let me just open my notes to make sure I don't say anything mm -hmm. wrong. And I should say um, that I have... Well, let me come back to that question because um, I'd have to double check the immunofluorescence findings on Haley Haley. Um, it's, I believe it's um, uh, actually more of a, um, it's a calcium transporter defect. Um, so rather it's not really an autoimmune phenomenon. Um, and so um, uh, it, it's, it's an acanthalytic process rather than an autoimmune process. And so I believe you really shouldn't have very specific findings on um, Haley Haley versus real pemphigus being an autoimmune process is where you're going to have that chicken wire uh, deposition. But I will double check that to be sure because I haven't looked up immunofluorescence of, of Haley Haley, but I think it's because it's not characteristically something that you do immunofluorescence for. Okay, then what do we have? Um, any morphologic clues um, between DFSP and dermatofibroma. So um, morphologic clues would be um, where the tumor is, um, is I would say architecture of the tumor rather than, you know, don't zoom in on the cells. You know, the cells can look somewhat similar. Um, this is a, you know, low power thing. A lot of derm path is look at the architecture of the tumor. So big bulky uh, tumor that um, uh, is centered in the deep dermis 
dissecting through the fat in a honeycombing pattern is going to pretty much always be the case in DFSP, whereas dermatofibroma, it should potentially kiss the fat but not go any deeper. Um, the, the peripheral collagen trapping can actually be seen in both as well. So don't rely on that either, um, uh, although it's more common in a benign dermatofibroma. Um, architecturally, um, uh, the dermatofibroma will also be more likely to have overlying epidermal change. So often it kind of goes really close to the epidermis and as it does so, it induces some changes. So we talked about the tabling of the reedy ridges with hyperpigmentation. That's one, one effect that the DF induces in the epidermis. Um, another effect is um, some um, basaloid induction. So you can actually have what looks sometimes like a superficial basal cell over a dermatofibroma. In fact, I've seen many superficial basal cells miscalled um, in something that is actually a dermatofibroma because they've missed kind of the bulky tumor beneath it um, in a superficial shave biopsy. So um, uh, look for those overlying induction changes as a clue for dermatofibroma, the peripheral collagen dropping. But again, nothing is a set thing that's, you know, you can definitively exclude DFSP um, with the exception of that infiltration of the fat. That is, DF should not infiltrate the fat. DFSP should infiltrate the fat. I'd say that's the number one thing. And then, of course, you've got your IHC, which is often tested, CD34 positive for DFSP uh, versus factor 13A positive for dermatofibroma. What about SOX10 versus S100 for melanoma? Which is better? Uh, so as far as your regular garden variety melanoma, you can choose your favorite stains. They're going to stain with all the melanocytic markers. The exception is going to be your desmoplastic melanoma. So desmoplastic melanoma can just be extra tricky because not only is it scary in that it can mimic a scar histologically, um, but it is scary because some of your melanocytic markers might not stain it. So if you throw the wrong markers on there, you might easily miss it. So think SOX10 for desmoplastic melanoma every other melanoma, you do what you like. Okay. Can we certainly diagnose a post-irradiation angiosarc versus atypical vascular lesion of skin or breast without MIC in routine practice? Um, I don't recommend it. Um, I, you know, MIC, MIC is there and available for that very purpose. Um, as far as I know, there's not an easy way to distinguish. It's really hard to make the call between a post-irradiation angiosarc versus an atypical vascular proliferation after radiation. And a CMIC is, is a great way to, um, to differentiate those. Um, all right. Any other questions that we have for today's talk? I think that's all we have in the, the podcast. And so um, I will stop share here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Skowski. This was amazing. And uh, thanks for all the time. And you have covered so many entities, uh, you know, in, in such a very comprehensive way with lots of differentials that you have shared with uh, us and so many mnemonics. And I'm sure the mnemonics would be uh, really helpful for the, you know, like the trainees. And I especially love the mnemonic of Pleva that you can, you can uh, have the same mnemonic for histologic features of Pleva as well. So thanks a lot. And I think these are all the questions uh, that we had on both Facebook and YouTube. And you would be really delighted to know that uh, we had lots of viewers from across the world. And I think um, over 200 viewers who joined. And we had viewers who joined from different countries, including Cambodia, Vietnam, Myanmar, Thailand, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, India, UK, Libya, and of course, many joined from the United States as well. And uh, thanks to our viewers for your continued support. And uh, please don't forget to follow podcast on different social media platforms. So let me show you this. So we have YouTube channel, as you guys know, so you can follow us on the YouTube channel and you can follow us on uh, what's that called? The Facebook and uh, also on X and as well as um, yeah, our website too. And uh, our next lecture is actually on HEMPAT. So this is on April 23rd. And our speaker is Dr. David Casarino. And actually, this is also a dermatopathology related topic. And he's going to talk on cutaneous T cell lymphomas and lymphoproliferative disorders and hope to see you at that time. And I really want to thank all the viewers and especially a lot of viewers joined from Jorhat Medical College. Thanks to those residents. And I also want to thank uh, 
our uh, hematopathology fellow at uh, City of Hope, Dr. Jack Reed, for organizing and helping uh, to organize this lecture today with Dr. Skopsky. And thanks again, Dr. Skopsky, for joining us and for this amazing talk today. Thanks a lot. Such a pleasure being here. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you so much.